Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you to this web event hosted by IPR Plaza. As you might know, IPR Plaza hosts web seminars on intangibles each month. And the topic of today's webinar is changing how you think about intangibles, creating value for your company through active intangibles management. It will be presented by two IP professionals, Mary Adams, she's principal of Track Consulting, and Steve Huybrechts, a global partner at Transurprise and Associates. And during the event, you can use the Q&A or chat function to type your questions. Please send it to all panelists. At the end of Steve and Mary's presentation, there will be time to answer some questions. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A or chat function and send it to all panelists. Well, Steve, I would like to give the floor to you. Steve? Thank you, Evelyn. Is this loud and clear? Evelyn? Yes. Is this loud and clear? Yes. Yes, you're okay. loud and clear. Well, good, uh, good morning and good afternoon to all, uh, uh, all of you. Uh, we will, uh, Mary and I will uh, talk about uh, the active use of, uh, of intangibles uh, in, uh, in a corporate setting. Um, and I would like to have the first slide, please, uh, Evelyn. Uh, you can also do that yourself uh, I if you like. I would like you to, to move it. Yes, uh, to okay. And uh, the whole concept, if you look at the management board of a company uh, where we have a, a CEO um, who is uh, busy with a lot of unique uh, features of, of its organization and, and doing business development at the same time. On the other side, we have a CFO who is um, uh, having a, a couple of primary processes uh, one of them is uh, you have cash, you buy inventory, you sell it, you have debtors, um, and then hopefully the debtors pay to bring you cash again. That's a primary uh, cycle, which a primary process, which uh, uh, is part of a business control uh, framework. So if you look at this slide on, the, on your screen, it's a mission, vision, and strategy where the board is responsible for and subsequently the CFO requires a business control framework to, uh, to have checks and balances in place on those primary processes. Um, it could be a supply demand process, it could be a, um, a logistic process, it could be a billing process. Um, all these processes typically are considered to be part of the role description of a CFO its main responsibilities. Uh, what you see on the picture, though, is uh, 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 what is typically considered a secondary process at the level of the CFO, and that is called intellectual capital, capital or intellectual property management. Um, so far, we've seen, uh, we see a lot of CFOs uh, addressing these issues as uh, cost uh, based and, and uh, very much from a cost uh, driver's perspective rather than from a value-driven uh, perspective. That means the, they won't spend a lot of time on it. Uh, since it's not on their balance sheet, uh, as long as it's not acquired from a third party, uh, they will not necessarily see that as an integral part of their uh, role description. And, and that makes it one of uh, the, the so-called uh, hidden crown jewels. Uh, so whatever intellectual capital and intellectual property is built up within the firm, not being capitalized, not immediately hitting balance sheets and P&L, does get uh, somewhat of a limited time span from, uh, from a board's perspective, but certainly from a CFO's perspective. The minute you start talking about these internally developed <clears throat> intangibles as value drivers, uh, they um, should or could earn some more time being spent by the CFO on, uh, on these type of issues. 
And with that, I would like to shift to the to the next slide, where Mary is going to tell us uh, what the relevance is of intangibles in, in in the corporate setting. Great, thanks, Dave. I'm really happy to be here, and um, I, I think it's really interesting whenever you and I talk about um, transfer pricing and and the context uh, in which you work with with companies, because it's it's one of the frontiers. Uh, and one of the most active frontiers uh, between uh, the world of intangibles and and the existing management and accounting systems that we have. And there's a real mismatch right now between our systems, which are really optimized in the industrial era, and our uh, reality, which is very much the knowledge, the social era. So um, what I thought I'd do is provide a kind of two sets of um, – information here. First, I'd like to give you some context of the what's really going on at a macro level so that you can understand uh, the context of, of the decisions that you're making on a daily basis about transfer pricing of, of individual uh, products or services. And then um, I'd like to uh, propose a framework that we use to help people understand what that looks like inside their own businesses. And then I know Stafe has a, a slightly different but um, similar framework that he uses, and so he'll follow on with with that. And um, by the end, I think it'll be interesting. We'll have pulled it a, a lot of different ideas together. So I'll jump in here on this slide. Um, what you're seeing here is data that um, the conference board um, has made available. Uh, the conference board actually has been a leader in creating this um, approach to looking at macroeconomic data. So this isn't accounting data, this is macro data. Um, but this is, uh, and this specifically is for the United States, but um, this approach and methodology uh, by Corrado and Halton, as you see the names here on the bottom, um, have been adopted throughout the OECD and, and many more countries. So this is the way that um, economists are trying to measure the intangibles economy. So what does this show? It basically starts right after World War II, and it looks at the investment um, that at the top left it says percent of um, NFB, that's non-farm business output. So what it is is just showing the trend of investment by corporations over um, the period since World War II. And you can see the investment in intangibles has climbed steadily um, and actually crossed over in the U.S. and started exceeding the investment in tangibles uh, over uh, 20 years ago. And so um, it, uh, I, I always like to start here because um, one of the things that faces all of us in the intangibles community is that people say, well, it's intangible, it's unknowable, it's, you know, it's difficult to measure. Now, I know that you measure it on a micro level of, of specific transactions, but um, on all levels, it's very uh, real. And, and the reason we're here today is because investment has been made year after year, decade after decade, to build really a new kind of infrastructure in our economies. And that infrastructure is, you know, we're, we're calling it intangible. Um, so I'm going to um, call your attention to along the, the intangibles line, there are th two circles, one around 1981 and the other in the, in the mid-90s. Because on the next graph, I'm going to show you um, what, how this investment has been translated into uh, uh, corporate value. So uh, again, 1981, uh, 1990s. So this graph, you can see that I have the two circles again, is uh, a graph. The top line um, is the S&P 500 in the U.S. So this is one of the major stock indices in the U.S. And that top line shows the total corporate value uh, of these companies. Uh, the bottom line, it, the gray area, is the tangible book value. Um, the gold in between is intangible book value. That mostly comes when companies invest in um, intangibles. Uh, excuse me, when they buy another company and, and the intangibles get 
booked to the balance sheet. And the rest is what I'd, I like to call the intangible information gap. Um, it's not on the balance sheet. It's not visible, but there, but it's the excess of value over the uh, what's on the balance sheet. Uh, so going, going back to the two circles, uh, you see 1981 is when this red gap really began to uh, spread and, and grow. Well, 1981, for those of you who weren't there at the moment or weren't paying attention, was the year that the IBM uh, PC hit the corporate market. So you can see once um, we basically went from automating our bodies to automating our minds and, and more and more workers had this tool on their desk, we very quickly created a lot of excess value over the hard assets. And this is the value of you know, uh, spreadsheets and uh, Word documents and um, you know, the data that we could create. Um, and uh, you, know, you can see there was a considerable value created. But that, that value exploded in the mid-90s, which is when the Internet um, basically took all those PCs and connected them together. And this shows really how, how compelling and um, huge the value of collaboration and connection and networks are uh, in today's uh, economy. And so um, that huge um, boost, we had the dot-com bust after that, but as you can see on this next slide, um, this is the same data set, set just shown in a different way. Um, the other data set ended in 2005. Um, it was recently updated by Ocean Tomo um, to 2010, which was the depths of the Great Recession. And it's still holding at 80% intangible. So that red gap is here, the gold, ga the gold um, gap, and you can see you know, looking at it um, in this presentation, we basically went, the 80-20 split was, t you know, in favor of tangibles going back to the 70s, and today it's intangible. So very clearly the value of our corporations is now in intangibles. And lest you um, question whether <laughs> this is, Something that's been data that's been distorted by you know companies like Google and, and Microsoft. Uh, um, I think this is a really compelling chart. This is using the 75 versus 2005 data again, and it's showing um, the percentage of intangibles um, you know in these two uh, at these two different dates. So you can see going back pre you know the personal computer. There were a few um, industries that had high intangible value, um, specifically um, consumer staples, healthcare, and information technology. Uh, but what's striking about this is that it increased in those industries, but the dramatic increase in all, every other industry. So even at the, the lowest one shown here, um, utilities and financials, which are very you know, strongly asset-based financials are, you know, um, there's a lot of money, financial assets, obviously, on a balance sheet. Um, uh, utilities, the same thing, they're very asset-intensive. Nevertheless, even these have more than 60% intangibles. Uh, you know, so that gap between the balance sheet and the corporate value um, is is 60%. Um, so no matter where you are or um, what business you're in, uh, intangibles are really driving the value of your business. Um, and I'm just going to show you one last little data point um, because this is another place where many of us experience this, this information gap. Um, this is based on data. So 2007, this is right before the Great Recession. Um, uh, 2007, Ernst and Young looked at 700 uh, plus uh, mergers and acquisitions um, that happened all over the world, and they used uh, a, a very broad sample of small and larger companies, of uh, companies in many industries, and, and as I said, in many countries. Uh, so this is a little different from the, the data we looked at up to now was just the U.S. This is global data, uh, but you see it even the, even here that basically um, when one company buys another, they have to account for the full 
value of that business. It's the one time when the, when intangibles um, get actively uh, booked onto onto balance sheets, and on average, the uh, acquisition accounting for for the studied companies ended up with 30% tangible, so you know hard assets on the balance sheet. They booked 23% to intangible, so that slightly that's higher than you know, we saw it in the overall trend, but and and the most frequent um, intangibles booked there. Interestingly enough, for people who are in the IP world, um, they were trademarks. Um, uh, patents weren't a common thing to be um, capitalized, and then uh, customer lists were another um, common uh, item that got booked to the balance sheet. But to me, the most striking thing, and maybe I should have it in the same red here as in the ocean tomograph. Uh, is that 47%, so let's say close to half of the value of the average merger deal is booked to Goodwill. Now, Goodwill is an accounting custom. It's basically a plug number. It's the difference between what you can account for and what you can't account for. And it's, it's kind of a scary number because it, it's basically saying we have this huge gap that we cannot define the value of uh, of what a, one company is buying when they buy another company, and um, it, although it w takes very long to change accounting standards, and I totally understand that, um, it, the danger for management teams is that they let this accounting convention color their their mind, and that they allow the uh, corporate analysts, the stock analysts, and you know their many stakeholders to uh, see this as this huge information gap rather than trying to fill in the blanks. And if you go you know, mentally back to that first chart that I showed you where um, the, these intangibles have been built through investment, um, it's really in, in you know, your interest and, and it's really at the heart of the value of your business to understand where, where you've been investing, what you've built, how successful it is, What's what's the uh, what is that you know not only the the booked intangibles but what does that goodwill look like in reality in your own business? So uh, what I'm going to do is change gears and and show you as I said uh, a framework that we we like to use for making this real within um, companies and then show you some examples uh, of how the, this framework gets applied in, in real life. So um, these are the questions that we use, and these questions will make more sense as, as we go through these examples, but I, I, it's good to have it here as a reference point um, uh, for you. And you know, after, after uh, you get the slides from this, um, it's, it's a good um, starting point if you want to say, hey, you know, what what is our intangible capital in our own business? These are these are the questions that really um, can quickly unearth that. Uh, so and and uh, if you look at these questions, these are not mysterious questions. Uh, they're they're relatively easy to answer. And if you think about uh, as a you know as a financial um, person or as a, you know a business person, uh, they're really the components of any business plan. Uh, that explains what a company does. Uh, we just think it's very important to start with a, a specific inventory that identifies each of these unique pieces and then talks about how do you measure them, how do you manage them, how do you monetize them. So first question, who are your clients? Um, how do you create value for them? Sometimes that's through paid or unpaid activities. Um, uh, what are the key processes and knowledge that support this model? Um, uh, and for each of these questions, you know, usually the right answer for the first cut at, at identifying your intangibles is just four to six items. Uh, you know, uh, the second question is how do you create value? You know, it's uh, sometimes it's free offerings, and then what are your paid offerings? What are you know, are you offering software, services, products, et cetera? Um, who are the key partners that support the model? Again, today, in today's world, it's a rare company that is fully integrated and doesn't rely heavily on strategic suppliers. 
Uh, what are the key competencies your people need to support the model? This gets at uh, what people expect from you, and, and people are really kind of the beginning and the end of, of a company today. Uh, alpha, in the sense, kind of out the alpha and the omega. I mean, they, you know, knowledge starts with people and it gets refreshed with people. And, and even the best company, if the people don't come in the next day, um, uh, you're, you're up the creek. So, uh, and then finally, how do these pieces fit together and link to a market? And, and in this category, we, um, we're increasingly spending more time looking at culture. Uh, and we all, we've always looked at business model and, and uh, the overall market. Let me just run through a, a, a few examples of, of how this framework looks in, in real life. Um, here, sorry, I guess I, one more. This is the conceptual taking those questions and turning it into uh, something that more visual. Uh, you know, the human capital uh, employees collaborate with external partners. You create reusable knowledge designs and processes. The structural capital is really uh, the core of, of uh, you know, much of the structural capital is intellectual property, although it's not all intellectual property. Uh, and then, uh, you know, human relationship and structural are the foundation of a business, but it's not a business if you don't have uh, a, a viable business model and you're not addressing a, a viable market need. So that strategic capital is critical in, in pulling it all together. So let's run through a few examples, and I'm going to go from two extremes of the of the economy. We'll start with Globe, with um, Google and Apple, and then I'm going to take you all the way down to a very simple business. So uh, Mary, translating the yes, Mary, uh, uh, a few points uh, to to add to this. Uh, I think uh, sure. the. Uh, the, uh, in the information left. and expectation gap uh, we uh, we looked at before, um, that that being recognized, uh, the International Accounting Standard Board uh, just published, I believe, in October this year, um, a lineup where they understand that uh, accountants may not be able to capture all the value which is in a company, and the, this big goodwill gap you showed in that, that pie. Uh, a while ago on the 70% being intangible where a big chunk is, is booked as goodwill. So I, I think that's, that's a, a recognized um, a statement by the external accountants themselves. Uh, the, the other notion is that uh, the OECD uh, providing guidance on, on things like tax and transfer pricing has uh, recently acknowledged that, that a purchase price allocation uh, especially the goodwill portion cannot be considered uh, to be equal to the economic value of the intangibles. And as you know, transfer pricing is, is the art of allocating economic value amongst uh, group companies. So that's the OECD recognizing that what the accountants are doing is not really helpful, uh, not even as a starting uh, position. And then if you if you look at uh, just to give one example, uh, the annual report of Sanofi after they bought Genzyme, uh, it had booked in Goodwill uh, two interesting features. One was a R&D platform uh, which run in India, and, and obviously in uh, the whole discussion about an embedded workforce, is that an intellectual capital? I think it is. Is it an, an intangible uh, from um, a tax or transfer pricing perspective, that's questionable. Uh, another example in that Sanofi uh, report was a, a supply chain platform to deliver ethical drugs to Chinese customers. Well, if you have such a supply demand platform, obviously it has a value, it has an intangible value. Still, um, the accounting rules force accountants to book this in this uh, pretty mechanical leftover box called called goodwill, which means it's very hard to manage uh, because it's not separately identifiable as a, an asset on which you would be expecting a return. So you know, absolutely, and that's one of the big dilemmas of of all this. Safe is that um, you know if if you can't even if you can't get it into the accounting 
as a as a responsible manager, you can't ignore its importance to your business. And um, this issue of um, separability and uh, you know the ability to uh, put a value on things is is you know as I said earlier I mean it's you're at the front lines of this of this dilemma um, and some things you'll never be able to identify or I think we're a long way but you're 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 more uh, in, in tune with this than I am, but uh, you know we're quite a ways away from being able to uh, actually uh, quantify the value of all these pieces. Uh, but we we do have to understand the dynamic of how the system works. So um, is this a good time? I'll move forward with some of these examples, or do you want to yep. respond? Yeah, I okay. think uh, it's good timing. Okay. So I'm going to walk you through, um, as I said, these couple examples. And, and you know, Google search business is a really simple, uh, it's a huge, but a simple um, business that we uh, all understand intuitively. So, um, you know, using the, the concepts that I talked about before, um, uh, the people that started, you know, um, Google were too – grad students at Stanford, um, they created this search engine. The search engine is, you know, so the people obviously are human capital. The search engine is uh, a very powerful piece of structural capital, and there's obviously intellectual property embedded in that. Um, as the story goes, they immediately attracted a lot of users. Users are relationship capital that, um, uh, and you know, blew out the, the computer systems at Stanford. Uh, but interestingly, this still wasn't a business. You had incredible users, um, a strong piece of, of structural capital, and, and good people. You know, they started adding obviously to the founders, um, but you didn't have a revenue source. And and of course, the big innovation of Google was to match the uh, match the searches with the uh, I'm just going to see if I have a use my pointer here. There we go. Match the searches with with the ads, um, and so the advertisers became uh, a key part of the relationship capital of Google. So, uh, and I actually have an, a, a narrated version of building this Lego model as a, as an illustration of, of Google's um, IC um, on the on the internet, so if you Google, you can grow like Google, you can find it. But uh, the point here is that if you want to understand the value of the Google search engine, you can't just look at the search engine. You have to really look at the system that it, it, within which it exists. And that system includes human capital, the structural capital of the algorithms for the search and the advertising, um, the users, the advertisers. It's it's a different way of thinking about business and looking at business, but really that's the way business works today. Um, and, and the Google search engine is one of the most powerful businesses because it's a continuous learning uh, piece of, uh, of software or product, but um, it's not all, not all the elements of this are owned by the organization, but all the elements are critical to its success. And so that's one of the reasons why we like to use Legos occasionally to show models of these things is because if pieces pop off, it, it doesn't work anymore. And so when you begin to think about, you know, the context of your own intangible capital, you have to think about this as a system, uh, not as discrete elements. Uh, at least on a strategic level, right? I mean, I understand that in transfer pricing, the the focus will be on the individual components of the of uh, the structural capital. But from a from a business perspective and a strategic perspective, and you know a value creation perspective, you have to be able to think uh, in a bigger picture. So uh, another quick example. I, I won't run through all the different elements with Apple, but but. You know, one of the critical in this era of Apple's development, um, one of the big moments was when they came out with the iPod, 
uh, a number of years ago. It almost feels like ancient history. It wasn't that long ago. But the critical um, innovation and the uh, catalyst for incredible value creation there wasn't the iPod itself, although like all Apple products, it's very cool, it was easy to use, you know, um, uh, it, it looks great, but but the iPod was useless without having music on it, and so the the real value there came when when Apple created you know developed all these relationships and contracts with all the music uh, suppliers, and uh, you know which is relationship capital, um, and that's really the catalyst within this system. That that turned you know Apple the iPod into such a breakthrough product and really set the stage for the follow-on products with the iPhone and the iPad. So um, again, one specific element isn't you know isn't enough. It's usually the combination of elements, and you have to you know break down and think about the human element, uh, the relationship element, the structural element, and then the business model. Now, just so that you don't think, and, and it, I, it's a weird place because this is my last slide for this part, that I'm going to totally switch gears on you, but I want to I want to make it very clear to you that this applies to every business. So this is the place where I take my car to get the oil changed and, and get gas. I live in the center of an old New England town. And uh, a number of years ago I was sitting um, – Sometimes in the winter they actually pump your gas for you. So uh, I was sitting looking at his at the um, window of this business, and, and I went onto their uh, website. And the owner of the station here is is this guy um, Dick Urikian, and and Dick, um, you know, fixes cars for a living. And I, I bet if you told him when he was in high school that he would put a picture of himself. Up, you know, he wouldn't know what the internet was, but you know, circulated to the whole world of him sitting at a keyboard. You know, he would have laughed. But the way that he shows that he is uh, a viable and a and a an attractive business um, that you would want to use is to show that he's connected. That you know, they have access to the databases with all the parts. Um, the, you can see up here; it's a very small station. It has two little uh, garage bays over here. There's no place to store inventory. So this is basically just a setup of saying these are the things we have. So the, he doesn't have tires in inventory. He has just-in-time suppliers. He has the relationship capital to get the tires or any part he needs by, the. you know, he figures out what he needs in the morning, calls me. I say, go ahead. He gets the part. They have it in, and, and you go pick up the car at 5 o'clock. That's a really efficient knowledge business. Uh, a couple other things, his human capital here, this ASE is a certification that um, all uh, – it's, it's become kind of the standard for uh, people that fix cars. They all have to have this basic certification, um, not required by the government, but uh, by the marketplace. Uh, you can't see it here, but there's all, they also are certified by the state of Massachusetts to do a safety inspection of the – of the car, another form of relationship capital. The point is, is that um, you know you may not work for Google, you may not work for this gas station. You're somewhere in between, but every business has this intangible capital infrastructure inside of it, and it's really what's driving value. So, Steve, I'm going to turn it back to you and um, let you run through some of the examples of the of the way that you look at it, and then we can circle back at the end and maybe pull it all together. Well, the, the next slide is uh, on the, on the, uh, it's quite different. It's not a picture taken of a, of a, a factual product, so, but it's a value chain as a combination of arrows uh, which go from uh, uh, buying from third parties to selling to third parties, uh, which creates a wall-to-wall -wall margin. And this is the firm infrastructure, sorry, this is the, the firm Zara uh, in the apparel business, which, uh, as, as we all can see, has a, a few primary processes, uh, the, which, which is the inbound logistics operations, outbound logistics, marketing, and sales. 
and, and services where the um, uh, support activities uh, include an, a, an infrastructure, um, both operational as well as uh, IT uh, and HR, uh, a, a technology development and a procurement element. Uh, the, the major issues here is if you look at SARA, what is really their top three of intangibles? Um, and, and then you're looking at uh, the, the whole um, configuration of uh, SARA, uh, where the, the store manager of a, a, a SARA retail uh, shop has a PDA which, uh, with, with which he can transfer information to, uh, to the uh, all the way back through the value chain uh, to the point of sourcing, which means if he needs another uh, pair of uh, uh, red trousers, he can order them right away, uh, but it's almost, uh, as, as, as Mary in, indicated, a just-in-time delivery process, because once that signal goes back from that real retail stop, uh, shop into the, the value chain, uh, the whole lo logistic um, uh, setup of uh, Tsara comes into play, and that's exactly the supply chain platform, which is uh, visualized here as, as a number one intangible, which is uh, is, is very important in, the, in in that whole setup. Uh, that is the IT configuration, the PDA sending the signal back to uh, to the uh, uh, to the operations, uh, sorry to the to the sourcing, and having a logistic uh, infrastructure which SARA keeps the suppliers of apparel very close to uh, uh, to the to the source to their logistic uh, uh, setup so that means a big chunk of uh, what Zara orders doesn't come from Asia but comes from the countries around uh, Spain that means they can do quick orders they don't need to wait for a boat with the apparel or a plane to to bring the apparel home that means they can restock a whole retail store in, in a matter of two weeks. So that's uh, that, that's the value the value chain. Uh, the, the, sorry, the intangible number one. Intangible number two is their their operations, which includes a component called design. They have about uh, I, I believe a couple of hundred designers who um, um, who challenge the market, look at new trends, uh, redesign uh, what the new trends are, and in some cases even have the, the, the new designs uh, of the next uh, season of apparel in the stores quicker than the original designers do. So that means they have, a, have, have found a way to um, read what the market wants, uh, convert it into real products a lot quicker than anyone else, and, and that has given them another advantage. So that's a, a, a translation of demand into real production. Um, so that's, an, although again, not very protectable, not very, very much an intangible in the narrow sense of IP law. It is a, it is a big differentiator of, uh, of the Tsara uh, value chain. Um, last but not least, they um, they have. A very atypical marketing strategy. The, 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 I believe that their um, uh, marketing cost to sales is, is a, a very low number. Uh, instead of spending all that money on, on uh, marketing campaigns and, and printed press, uh, they spend most of that, of that money on the um, interior and exterior of their shops and, and uh, thereby distinguish themselves uh, in, in that way. So they create a premium brand um, and, uh, against affordable prices, which is uh, a different, uh, which really distinguishes Sara from all the other apparel uh, companies uh, in, in the way they brand and deal with, uh, with marketing. Mary, any, any thoughts on this? But you know, I think you're you're sh you're definitely showing the same things. You're just breaking it down. Um, this value chain is, uh, you know, since Michael Porter developed it a number of years ago. I mean, it's 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 a great way of thinking in, in a linear way about 
what a company is doing, and this is the way most people think about. It. So, whatever, however people connect with what's going on, I think it's um, it's helpful to to break these down. And I guess the the interesting thing is that in the past we thought of the product and the and the tangibles that you know the machinery that was driving this product uh, process as like the core asset and now it's really the processes and the knowledge around it that's that's become the core asset. Let's move to the next slide. Uh next slide is uh Walmart's uh and Walmart has been uh, uh very much a uh, an example in in retail America um where Typically in retail, you you do see the concept of bargaining power, uh, but not so much the uh, the concept of uh, of uh, intangibles in the way we talk about it. So I thought it was be, it would be interesting to again take uh, the primary activities on the on the on the top uh, top end inbound uh, operations, outbound marketing and sales and services, and the support activities. And again, through one, two, three, highlight what uh, what the intangibles are. If you start with uh, intangible one, um, I think uh, Walmart owns the biggest uh, um, uh, server on on tracking goods uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, that means any goods they buy, any goods they have on storage uh, uh, anywhere in the in the in the world is followed through a satellite tracking system, which is owned by by Walmart. That means they they are really in control on each and every detail. Uh, they place their warehouses in in, uh, in a very uh, geographically optimum uh, against uh, uh, vis a vis the uh, the real stores, so they don't lose any any money on that and are uh, uh, pretty much um, uh, able to to organize the logistics as efficiently as you can possibly think of. So that's that's an IT platform which um, uh, helps them to manage this whole uh, massive exercise of getting all the products uh, on time in the right location without losing too much uh, inefficiencies. Uh, the second one is they have a simple procurement model which, which looks a little, little bit, uh, I believe, like the IKEA business model. They go to suppliers and, and they uh, want full transparency of the suppliers, and they want to um, to be able to offer, uh, to offer the lowest prices to their to the to their customers, which means they uh, really want suppliers to come up with a transparent um, uh, explanation of their cost price, and they set targets with their suppliers what the cost price or the efficiency in that uh, could be uh, next year. So the whole procurement arm uh, has been organized in such a way that it creates full transparency and uh, uh, Walmart, for, for one, has eliminated all buying agents from the cycle by going, uh, going straight back to, uh, to the place of the producer, uh, the third-party producer, and negotiate with the producer uh, this level of, uh, of transparency. Well, that... Uh, is uh, is another uh, intangible which, which makes uh, Walmart uh, uh, quite quite unique in in the way it's being organized. Um, last but not least, uh, the, the whole brand of Walmart and and uh, the, uh, the the whole concept of um, they have everything against low pro the low low prices has been uh, worked out in, in, in very detail and have, has been assessed by, by many par parties as, um, uh, yeah, as a, a, a new concept, uh, especially the scale, of, the scale on, on which these, uh, these Walmarts uh, have been set up makes it uh, quite a unique uh, setup. Um, I think the challenging bit on these intangibles, because they are very much uh, going back to what Mary calls relationship capital, uh, is how sustainable are certain of these relations going to be if you squeeze too much of the margin from, say, a supplier out of the supplier so the supplier doesn't 
uh, d doesn't run a sustainable business anymore. So that's that's the balancing act uh, and, and sort of also the challenge uh, I believe Walmart uh, is looking at when when looking at uh, its free intangibles. Let's move to the next slide. Um, yeah, the, the 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 starting point was how do we get the board uh, and convince the board that intangibles or in, in, in intellectual capital is not something they only have to spend costs on, but it's it's also something they can make money on. Um, the uh, uh, setup is that if you have in-house exploitation of technology, you can make your own products. If you have, uh, and, and we see that in the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, where there's also a lot of in licensing happening, uh, simply because uh, one one big pharma house might not be uh, have uh, might not have access and might not uh, have an R and D which is successful enough to fill uh, fill the pipeline with uh, with uh, ethical. Uh, uh, products, ethical drugs in the, in the marketplace. Then uh, there's an uh, an other concept, uh, the the which, which I believe recently there was an IP exchange being set up by a couple of parties. One of them being Philips, uh, a Dutch-based multinational, which is uh, known for uh, for doing a lot of R&D, being very successful on the R&D side, but not being very Successful um, uh, across the board on, on commercializing that R that R and D. So those companies uh, are in need uh, if they want to continue to ride the R and D cycle, are in need to license out their technology to anyone who wants to pay for it. So that is a other uh, uh, means to to make money on your technology, and I think only. Uh, fairly recently, and just to, to picture uh, uh, Philips. Philips is uh, probably uh, the, the multinational in the Netherlands with uh, the largest numbers of patents uh, being registered on a, on a yearly basis already for decades. So they're really ahead of the curve. Uh, on the other side, they had a, a, a fast move in consumer products division, including televisions, uh, etc. They had a light division and they had um, a medical equipment division, the fast-moving consumer goods division is not doing too well. So Philips, although it was very R&D intensive, moved away almost from the fast-moving uh, um, the, 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 the fast consumer goods uh, we were, were looking at uh, through, uh, through television sets and, uh, and toothbrushes, electric uh, to toothbrushes. Uh, so the question is now: Philips moves to become an industrial uh, industrial M and E rather than uh, so more a B two B rather than a, a B two C. What impact does that have on uh, on the R and D cycle? And if you have a lot of excess uh, R and D, what do you do with it? Uh, so licensing out is uh, is going to be a big uh, big thing in the in the near future, uh, where you see. Um, in, in recent times, uh, you've seen also um, the sale of technology. I think a recent one, and that, that was, um, I believe, it was Google uh, or Facebook who bought a big uh, portfolio of patents from Panasonic uh, just to beef their uh, their patent profile in the, in the, in the marketplace. Uh, some of them uh, being. Uh, being more protective and strategic than really uh, utilizing those, uh, but that's a, that's a third way of uh, of uh, building your profile as a technology company. Maria, anything to add to this? You know, I, as you were talking, I was thinking. You know, um, we've been seeing more and more where um, companies that get good at something end up. Um, monetizing their their knowledge through either services or um, you know different kinds of new offerings and so uh, a simple example of this is you know how um, UPS and FedEx have really become especially UPS become logistics companies not just 
um, product delivery companies. They're so good at logistics that they've taken over uh, things like uh, one of the things we, we um, describe in our book is how they took over uh, PC repair for, I believe it was HP for on some of their lines, where um, you know the the challenge of repairing a PC was was less about the technology fixing the PC, the money and the and the and the way, uh, ability to do it economically really was a logistics problem. And so, you know, you can you can extend your um, product line and your offering by by taking your knowledge and applying it in new places. Um, we've also we had three different clients in the last year where the where their clients were saying um, you're so good at this we wish you would train our people now training isn't a very scalable business but it's a hell of a good way to be really close to your customers and and taking them kind of to the next level so um, not all three decided to do it but um, a couple of them did and it and it's a very powerful thing for them uh, so so it, knowledge is a very malleable asset, and it can be applied and sold and used in many different forms. And, and that's really, you know, what's exciting about being in business today and, and can be very scary as well because, um, you know, <laughs> what's the right strategy? What are, how many places can we go at once, um, you know, are all challenges that people face. But, um it, it it makes it possible to you know continue to make money on on the same expertise over and over again. Okay, let's uh, move to the next slide. This is a uh, somewhat of a, a technical picture, which is uh, two patents uh, uh, which Nestle filed for its uh, newest version of uh, the Nespresso machine. And what uh, the, the just to in the sake of time, what the right picture really indicates is that uh, the capsule has a a uh, alumni uh, cover on top of it. Only if you insert the alumni cover, the capsule with the alu alumni cover in the machine, it it will uh, act as a uh, a connection between two, two electronic wires and makes the machine work. So uh, the war on the capsules uh, is not over yet, uh, and, and this is a, 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 an example where you see the, the um, uh, patent on the capsule uh, Nestle has uh, had, had filed a, a while ago is, is due to expire, and how Nestle ex uh, expands the economic lifetime of that uh, patent is by using uh, the capsule, although that's not being protected anymore, but it's using the, the seal on top of the capsule to create a new machine, apply a patent on it, and uh, thereby extend its uh, unique position in the, in the market of, uh, of coffee machines and, and, and capsules. So this is an, uh, another way of uh, making money on the intangibles uh, you have at stake. Uh, next slide, please. This is a, uh, a a recent example. As we all know, Starbucks is an uh, extremely uh, successful uh, franchise concept uh, started in the U.S. and uh, runs through uh, people who, uh, who who take a license. And, and to some extent, Starbucks also owns the stores. Uh, so there's a portion of third-party licensees or franchisees as well as a portion of the shops which is Starbucks uh, uh, organization owned. Um, the, uh, the, the whole image around Starbucks uh, had, had to deal with some, some big issue and, 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 and maybe uh, they, they've been a little bit too, uh, too creative. They had reported, and that's, uh, that was in the news three, four weeks ago, they had reported a, a continuous series of uh, losses uh, in Starbucks UK, uh, which, um, as you can imagine, was was picked up by a, a few newspapers uh, like the Guardian, uh, but even the Financial Times uh, made some some uh, noise on that, where they came up with the story that 
the fact that uh, Starbucks UK was paying a a royalty of I believe six seven percent uh, to a, um, a another Starbucks company um, in in another jurisdiction which was considered to be somewhat of a dodgy transaction. In this case, it was uh, paid, I believe, to Starbucks Europe uh, BV as well as to uh, Swiss Entity, uh, led to a lot of um, reputational damage because the way The Guardian and the Financial Times reported about it is uh, that, that they said, well, there's not a real base. Why, why would you charge 7% for a, uh, the use of a brand or, and the use of a service concept? Uh, which which puts the local UK Starbucks entity in in uh, a structural loss already for many many years. That that must almost mean that Starbucks is not a a good corporate citizen. So this is an example where the payment for technology is is not easy to explain to a wider audience and uh, have led uh, not only to a a discussion about uh, the the level of of the royalties, but uh, led immediately even in the, the UK Parliament to a corporate reputational issue, which had an immediate impact on the on on the brand. And I I believe the latest news in the uh, a week ago was that Starbucks uh, volunteered to pay some some more corporate income tax than than they they had done in the in the past, just to satisfy the uh, public public opinion. So this is where technology and franchise concepts and a fee paid for that uh, leads to uh, uh, yeah, a, a pretty uh, angry audience in the, in the UK and, and a potential corporate reputation damage which goes beyond what you, you've been building up over, over those years. Any uh, thoughts on that, Mary? No, I think that, you know, um, that's a huge issue that will um, only continue to grow in the future. Um, uh, and, you know, as I said, I, I, I love to follow what's going on in the transfer pricing space because uh, you're really on the front lines of uh, the challenges of, of you know, uh, monetizing and accounting for uh, the movement of, of knowledge around the world, and it's it's a complex thing, but you know we're, we've figured it out, and we'll continue you know we'll continue to get better at it. So. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Yeah, this is uh, an, another way of looking at what we just discussed. And uh, Mary has a different background. Uh, IP lawyers have a different background. I'm more from the tax and transpricing scene. We have a different background. But we all talk, when we talk about intangible, about a label. We all talk about how to identify it, because uh, the, the intangible nature does not make it easy to, to touch it. Uh, then we also all, we, we all like to know who is the owner. And, and obviously, if you talk uh, with an IP lawyer, he only has the legal ownership definition. If you talk to a tax person, uh, it might easily be that uh, he or she also comes up with the, the other notion of economic ownership. Um, so, and then at the end of the day, everyone wants to know the value. So if you look at this IPR matrix as we refer to it, there's four functional variables uh, which, which every professional around the world uh, deals with. Uh, but, and subsequently, subsequently, there's a, uh, uh, a couple of disciplines involved in, uh, in uh, these four functional variables. Uh, could be an IFP management consultant uh, like, like Mary, uh, could be um, uh, someone with an accounting background, someone like me on tax and trans pricing, an IP lawyer. Even on, on cases like antitrust, uh, we've seen the, the whole notion of um, being a, a semi-monopolist or perceived uh, monopolist like Microsoft and the antitrust regulations in the EU, it's all about intangibles and how intangibles allow you to block out other uh, 
competitors from a certain space in the uh, in in your industry. Or if we're looking at bankruptcy, and the, I, I believe the Nortel case is a, is a good example where uh, CEO and CFO looked at the, on the on the table on their balance sheet and P and L and didn't find any value left anymore and, and declared a Chapter 11. The the liquidator who came on board to looked under the table and found uh, between three and four uh, uh, billion dollars of worth of patents which were subsequently sold. So so apparently there's there's quite some disciplines involved in these four functional variables uh, relating to uh, to intangibles. That means if you talk to someone who has a different background as a professional, uh, it, it, it is wise to make sure you understand the, the, the different labels they might use, the different ways to identify whether they only have legal or also other ways of ownership and, and what type of valuation standards they bring to the table uh, where so far the, 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 the investigation we've been doing and, and the, the, the practice, uh, there's, there's a lot of different valuation standards for different purposes. You have international standards and you have national standards and uh, the ranking uh, between those different standards is not always uh, uh, as clear as you would like it to be. Larry, any any thoughts on this? No, I I, I love this graph, and it's and it's the it's the dilemma that we all face. And you know, when you start thinking strategically about um, intangibles, you get even more people on that list. You get people from human capital and marketing and uh, operations and IT and, you know, um, everybody has their own definitions and and uh, obviously, you know, work that they have to do with the intangibles. And so one of the things that's at the core of what, I, you know, the message that I'm trying to bring to people and that, you know, you and I have talked about SAFE over time is the need for people to come to a holistic understanding. We all have different um, areas of expertise, we're going to do what we have to do in our jobs. But if we uh, don't find common ground and we don't find a shared view of what's going on and what our core intangibles are, uh, then then you know some of these different roles end up working against each other, and that's obviously very counterproductive when we're talking about you know an asset class that is driving 80% of the value of, of businesses today. So, um, you know, Stafe and I have been saying it in different ways, but we're both trying to say you want, you got to, you know, as a, as a leader within your firm, find ways of helping people see that core um, in a way that everyone can relate to and, and, you know, so that you're all working from the same base. Yeah, and, and, and as, as a closing remark, I think uh, each company and, and board of a company is almost, uh, I, I, I would invite those people to define an IP policy, uh, see IP as a value driver you can make money uh, with rather than a cost driver, uh, which inevitably, inevitably, and that's uh, still the, the big challenge, uh, Mary and I see in practice, CEO and CFOs are already locked up in so many other stakeholders uh, debates uh, which means they they run 24/7 and, and don't necessarily spend what we believe sufficient time on on the, on what seems to be making up uh, uh, 50 to 70 percent of the value of their business uh, and I think that um, uh, requires a, a shift in gears but also a shift in where, where we we started off with the, the fact that the accounting industry doesn't recognize all these valuable uh, features uh, is, is sort of undermining the concept, uh, um, whereas the commercial reality seems to say, well, whenever it's unique enough, you make more money on it, uh, should be really driving uh, that commercial reality rather than an accounting reality should be driving the attention of, uh, of the management board on, uh, on these matters. I think this uh, is bringing us uh, close to uh, the final um, uh, points of, uh, of our presentation. Mary, any final words before we open the floor for maybe one or two questions? 
Um, you know, just to say thanks, I you know I always welcome these discussions and and uh, you know we're, we've made a lot of progress in in helping people see all this, and I think there's lots more work to do. So hope we can continue the conversation. Um, I got a question in uh, from India, uh, where it says, "Is the goodwill valuation uh, more negotiation and less rationale or scientific?" That's a very good question. I think we had uh, a discussion with uh, the OECD member states a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in, in Paris uh, on this same topic: Is goodwill a mechanical? Uh, exercise where anything you cannot identify as, as uh, a separate, identifiable, intangible, uh, so call it the leftovers, uh, or is goodwill valuation um, still reflecting in economic uh, value? Uh, the, the, the notion of most people is, uh, the, the first notion, it is a mechanical uh, exercise of leftovers uh, although some of those leftovers we all know reflect uh, reflect quite a big uh, a, a big number as uh, as I was indicating in the in the example of Sanofi. Okay, uh, is there any final question? If not, I would like to close this session and thank you very much and. Uh, uh, keep, we keep you alert on uh, on uh, upcoming uh, IPR Plaza webinars, uh, and hope to uh, to see you again on on, the, on those events. Uh, have a pleasant day, and thank you again. Yes, I would thank also you. like to thank uh, everyone. Um, I would also like to uh, point out that this presentation presentation will also be uh, uploaded on IPR Plaza's uh, YouTube channel. And it can be found on uh, on IPR Plaza's website, IPRplaza.com. Um, a final question: uh, Please fill out the survey that will appear on your screen. Um, well, thank you, everybody, and have a nice day.